Hello. I'm not sure at all what time of day it will be when you will be listening to this because this is recorded and being sent out to you in these strange and uh, difficult days that we're passing through. Words such as unprecedented, unparalleled and uncharted waters are being used a lot these days. So I wanted to begin just by encouraging you with what you already know, of course, is that our God is omniscient and there are no unknowns with him. He knows all about these difficult circumstances that we're in. He is the omniscient God. I was reading recently in the 77th Psalm, one of Asaph's Psalms, how Asaph describes him as the one whose way was in the sea, whose paths lay through the great waters. So there are no uncharted waters with our God. He knows exactly what we're going through. And we look to him, we turn to him for encouragement and for instruction, particularly in these days. So we turn to his word, for that's where he reveals his name, his being and his will for us. I want to read with you from the Gospel of Matthew, please. Um, It's chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and I'd like to read the first 12 verses with you. Matthew 5 and verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed the peacemakers, for they shall shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I've been asked to say something about these verses. We know them as the Beatitudes and they form the first part of what is commonly referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew records it in his 5th, 6th and 7th chapters. And before I say any more, I think I need to say to my Canadian brothers and sisters that I was checking back through some notes and I found that in 2008, we spent time in these 12 verses in Brantford. I think we took one per night. Then 10 years later, and I think I was standing in for a brother who was unable to uh, speak at the brother's weekend up at Guelph. In 2018, we returned again to this teaching in Matthew's Gospel. So I mention that in case you find me repeating anything that some of you have heard in the not-too-distant past, and I ask you to bear with me in that, please. I'd like to say something, first of all, uh, with regard to the setting. It was somewhere in the region of Galilee, possibly and probably the western side of the lake, up in the hill country of Galilee, on some level tableland that the Lord had ascended to, and drawing his disciples close to himself, he, seeing the multitudes coming up behind them, sat and he taught them, that is the disciples, I think it's important to note this teaching was for the disciples. It's kingdom truth. And somebody said this is the king's manifesto. And he was giving it that day to the little embryonic kingdom that he gathered about him, the apostles. As he looked out on the growing crowd, the multitude, coming up from the region of Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea, following seeking his teaching, it was out into those areas that the kingdom would reach and it would expand and grow. But it would do so through the teaching of these men. The apostles' teaching 
would go out into those regions and the kingdom would grow and be established there. So um, that's the setting of it. The manifest of the king, we've said, uh, it was to describe what the kingdom that he was setting up on earth would be like. And it was for his disciples because through them he would go out to others. Important to say that what's being described here are characteristics of those who make up the kingdom. That's what the Lord Jesus is describing. There are eight characteristics given altogether, and I'm looking forward to going through those with you. But before we begin that, we ought to think a little bit about this word blessed. In the context here in Matthew 5 and elsewhere in Scripture also, it describes both the condition and the consciousness of those that the Lord is here describing. So the poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are thirsting and hungering, the meek and so on, this describes their condition. They are blessed. In the English language, we're used to associating the English word happiness with being blessed. That's okay. It's an approximation. It doesn't cover the fullness of the, of the word that we're looking at. The English word contains the word hap, and that immediately thinks it makes us think of chance and circumstance. And that is so often where the happiness that people think of is found. It's open to the various experiences of life. And it comes and it goes. We find it, and we lose it. It's not a condition. It's a consciousness that comes and goes. Now, what the Lord is teaching here is quite different, fundamentally different. This state of happiness, this blessedness, is unassailable, is untouchable. It's independent of out outward circumstances. It's a condition that is offering to people that come into his kingdom. What a lot of sadness there is about us today. And bearing that in mind, this teaching that the Lord gives here is like water to a thirsty soul. It's much needed today. We're not only surrounded by sadness, we're surrounded by superficiality. And I don't say that judgmentally, but we find that men and women are constantly in pursuit of the consciousness of happiness. And I say it's the consciousness that they're pursuing, not the condition. They're seeking the consciousness without the change of condition that's necessary to experience what the Lord is here speaking about. The teaching of the Lord Jesus here cuts through all of that, of course. It cuts through the superficiality and it really does meet the need of all the sadness in these verses the lord jesus is showing the one true path to true happiness i've quite often used the illustration that william barclay gives in one of his books regarding the word the greek word that we find here which is makarios it was from Barclay that I learned that the Greeks have a description of the island of Cyprus. They call it He Makaria, which means the happy isle. The island of Cyprus has such rich, fertile soil and such an ideal climate that the Greeks thought, why would you want to go anywhere else? If you live in Cyprus, you have everything that you need. He Makaria, the, the blessed isle. It's a lovely thing that we find in the book of Ruth. In the second chapter, Boaz says to Ruth, do not go to another field to glean. Well, why would she? In the field of Boaz, she had everything that she needed. She had security, shelter, shade, that's protection. And she had provision. Protection and provision. Don't go, Boaz says, to another field to glean. All that she needed 
was there before her. It is so in the things of the Lord, isn't it? We have everything that we need in him. If only the world knew that, that in our Saviour and Lord is to be found the source of true happiness, which brings a condition that inevitably then leads to the consciousness. And the more we appreciate about our condition, what we have in him, the happiness, the consciousness of our happiness, our happy state will become known to us. In uh, the book of Ruth, again, chapter 2, the beginning of chapter 2, we read of Boaz coming into his field and he greets his workers. It's a lovely scene. He calls out to them uh, across the field of Bethlehem. The Lord be with you, he says. And their response to him comes echoing back across the field. And the Lord bless you. And there's our word again. Bless him. But Boaz is condition of being blessed didn't rest in his wealth in the first chapter of first verse of chapter two of Ruth we we read that he was a man of great wealth well that that's a translation of a Hebrew word kayil and it means he was a man of substance and sometimes it means material wealth but in the case of Boaz it meant much much more Boaz is state of being blessed lay in the relationship that he had with the Lord God of Israel. That's where it lay. So does yours. So does mine. It's the condition in which we find ourselves. Happiness then is not dependent upon doing or possessing. True happiness, the true state of being blessed, is what we are. And what we are in Christ, by the grace of God, is all that we need. Somebody said, if all you have is God, then you have all you need. That's true, isn't it? One more thing before we look at the particular characteristics in themselves. But you'll notice uh, in most English translations that the word are, A-R-E, is in italics, and that's to indicate that there's no equivalent word in the original manuscripts, nothing in the Greek, as we have it, for that word. That's been put in to make it sound like proper English. But if you take it out, as you may have noticed I did when we read it together, you have what I think is a proper exclamation. And I think we should read it that way. In the Aramaic, which would have been um, how the Lord spoke it that day in Galilee, Aramaic being the Hebrew of the day. It comes across as an exclamation. Interestingly, it's the first word that we have in the book of Psalms. Blessed the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. There's no word for is in the Hebrew, the way I just as there's no word for are in the Greek of our New Testament in Matthew 5. It's an exclamation. I've been taught, and I'm sure you have, to use exclamation marks sparingly as we put together our English sentences and compositions. Funny thing, when you come to speak about the things of God, it's very hard not to use exclamation marks. And here I'm suggesting to you is a passage that really, as we read it, is full of exclamations. Blessed the man. Blessed the man. want to mention to you a few negatives, what this state of blessedness is not, just to emphasise again what it really, truly is. It is not pious hopes. It is not a vague promise. It is not a glimpse into some future condition that hopefully we will one day know. And it's not an academic observation. It's an emphatic acknowledgement, a statement of the condition of those who are thus described. It's worth thinking about that before we begin tackling the characteristics themselves. Sit and think this morning or this afternoon or the evening, whenever you're listening to this, of the sheer bliss of being a Christian. 
the happiness, the blessedness of knowing Jesus as Saviour and Lord. Christianity is not a gloom-ridden endurance. It's not how we face our days, not how we work our way through them. We face them as people who are blessed, immeasurably blessed. Not a gloom-ridden endurance. I've sometimes shared, probably with many of you, the time that I used to sit and read with a dear old man who was blind, so he couldn't read for himself. I used to read the scriptures to him. He, he knew the scriptures. He was a churchman. He was actually a retired canon in the Church of England. And I remember one day we got into conversation about John Henry Newman's hymn, Lead Kindly Light. And it has in it a line, O'er moor and fen, o'er crag and torrent, till the night be gone. John Davis, that was his name, he said to me, that's a poor reflection of the Christian life, Phil. It's not supposed to be like that. Now, it's true that it often appears like that, and you may be feeling a bit that way as you go through these difficult days because of the effect of the virus. But we're addressing a passage of scripture here which is entirely different. It's speaking about our, our being blessed. That affects the path we walk on and how we walk on it. I love that verse in, in Proverbs chapter 5 that says the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. That's the path of those who are walking in the condition of blessedness that the Lord Jesus here describes.